I uh, used to work for a group called the International Forum on Globalization uh, for five years, and before that I worked for Congress, and I worked, I'm part of the uh, military industrial con congressional complex, uh, but I worked for Congressman John Conyers, and uh, thank you. <laughs> I'll just stay up here, that's right, thanks. Um, and part of my job was working on military issues for Congressman Conyers, which meant battling uh, head-on the military-industrial complex. So it was uh, quite a good position to be in. Um, but also, my work for Congressman Conyers started on uh, domestic social policy, so welfare, job training, health care, social security. Uh, this was during the Clinton administration, so what that mostly meant was trying to fight uh, the Clinton welfare reform bill. Um, which meant uh, for our constituents in Detroit, the largest welfare recipient population in the country, uh, that they were all going to be cut off of the rolls. Um, and when we lost, and they were cut off, uh, I received all the individual phone calls from all the women across Detroit who wanted to know what we were going to do to help them now that they couldn't afford to uh, provide food for their children or housing for their families. And. Um, Needless to say, my policy attention quickly turned to alternatives and the look for, looking for what we could do differently. And um, that took me to looking at community development block grants, which to make a long story short, uh, threw me right into the head of an international trade agreement that essentially would make it impossible for us to implement a community development block grant in Detroit. And this made me say, uh, question what I was doing and say, well, if multinational corporations can just leapfrog us and go to uh, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development or go to the World Trade Organization or go to these mumbo jumbo names of organizations that only five people in Washington know what they mean, um, then how am I going to be able to do the work that I want to do on a domestic level to really help, uh, help my country? Um, and I decided that what I needed to do was, was, was focus on international trade and investment rules uh, and stopping the, the policies that were being implemented and work towards the implementation of alternatives. Um, what these policies are called in the, in the shorthand is free trade. It sounds really good. Uh, most people in Seattle know more about the ills of free trade than probably most people. Um, but uh, free trade has all the same uh, connotations and wonderful feelings of freedom, but the term is just as misused as, as freedom is by, by those who, who use the term free trade. Um, and what I, what I learned very quickly was that under the guise of so-called free trade, a lot of very brutal uh, and deadly policies were being implemented. So when the Bush administration announced just 10 days after September 11th, that it would be countering terror with trade, I knew that something very disturbing was about to take place if I didn't know it before when the Bush administration came into office. Um, and the more I started looking, the more I identified what we're calling the, the structural causes of war, the structural motivations behind this administration. Um, and the, the title of my book um, is The Bush Agenda, Invading the World One Economy at a Time. It doesn't give the credit to George W. Bush. What it points to is a series of long-term uh, thinking among key political leaders on military and economic ideas that coalesced and have thus far reached their pinnacle during this administration. And therefore I call it the Bush agenda. But uh, they certainly have no interest in it ending with this administration. It certainly didn't begin with this administration. And what it is, is uh, unique to the modern era, the coalescing of m the overuse of the US military to accomplish a very clear economic agenda. And that economic agenda has everything to do with free trade. Um, but what that free trade means is the interests of the largest multinational corporations, not all multinational corporations, not all US corporations, but a subset, a subset that is intimately linked 
with this administration in a way that, again, is unique in the modern era. And by understanding the links between these specific companies and this administration and this war in Iraq, because now we have more than one war that the United States is involved in, um, this war in Iraq, the rest of the wars that are happening right now uh, in the Middle East that the U.S. is party to through Israel, and the larger interest through the rest of the Middle East, the better that we can unravel uh, those, those uh, the w better that we can unravel that agenda, stop the war, stop the Bush administration, and stop uh, the incursion of these corporations, which I absolutely 100% believe we can do, and I believe it's the people in this room that are going to have the most effect with that, because as Todd said, I think at the end of the day, it's getting this information more than anything else to potential military recruits to soldiers that are currently serving in the war that will shine that light that might not already be lighting, that aha light to say, no way, as if I could quote, um, uh, um, sorry, Cindy Sheehan on the back of my book, who wrote, um, all potential military recruits should read this book and then decide if Halliburton and Chevron are worth fighting for. I think that's a pretty simple way of putting it. Um, so I'm going to provide a little bit of this picture. I'm going to talk um, for a little bit longer, and then we're going to have a lot of time for questions, because um, I'm going to probably present, I'm, I'm hoping that I will present, I will present a lot of information that um, I would hope that we have, we have a discussion about afterwards, particularly targeted towards what we do about it. Um, there are four corporations that I focus on in particular, Bechtel, which is based in San Francisco, which is a family-owned business that traces its history back about 120 years. Um, the, uh, I'll get back to Bechtel. Bechtel, which is the largest construction and engineering company in the United States and one of the largest in the world. Um, Lockheed Martin, we all know who Lockheed Martin is. Um, Lockheed Martin also happens to have 16 former or current executives who serve in the Bush administration. It's an unqualified umbilical link between one company and the administration uh, and uh, Lockheed Martin, the, the, uh, in Todd's um, chart, the, the constant revolving door be between Lockheed Martin and um, the current administration is particularly unique and strong, including um, uh, Vice President Cheney's wife who served on the board of Lockheed Martin. Uh, Lynn Cheney. Um, then there is Chevron. Chevron is um, easily forgotten because it's got its big, big daddy Exxon Mobil. And Exxon Mobil is very important for us to focus on given the fact that Exxon Mobil over the last two years earned more, the largest profits of any corporation in world history. Uh, and that was the last, that was in 2004 and 2005. In the first quarter of 2006, they earned 34% more than they earned in the same period in 2005, which means that they are set to, I mean, the, the, the profits they are about to make are astronomical. And that is part and parcel to what I'm going to talk about, but I focus on Chevron uh, for several reasons. The most important being Chevron's very long and active history in Iraq, and in addition, of course, Ms. Condoleezza Rice, who it is very famously known uh, that Condoleezza Rice has a, has a Chevron oil tanker named after her. It's very less well known that she earned it. She spent 10 years on the board of directors of Chevron, and she was the head of their policy-making committee. She's intimately connected to this corporation, and its interests are intimately connected to her interests. Um, the other company is, of course, Halliburton. And uh, Halliburton's connections to Cheney are obviously well known. But what's less well known is, again, the umbilical link between Halliburton and the Bush administration. Because when Cheney was defense secretary for the prior Bush administration, he left that position to run Halliburton. He took a number of his leading um, compatriots from the senior Bush administration with him to Halliburton. He also took a tremendous amount of the Pentagon's budget 
with him and transferred an enormous amount of money that was once in the Pentagon budget that then got privatized into, the, into Halliburton's budget. Then when he came back to Bush Jr.'s administration, he again brought an enormous number of his Halliburton officials back into government with him so that in essence you can see that the Bush administration is, is sort of a both Bush administrations and Halliburton is just sister cousins to each other as they, you know, open, open one door and now I'm in the administration and another door and now I'm in the Halliburton headquarters. Um, and the fourth company, Bechtel, Lockheed, Chevron, Halliburton, that's four. Um, I pick these four companies because of their link to the Bush administration, but also because of their very long history in Iraq. And by looking at their history in Iraq and then their influence on the various Bush administrations and, the, and their influence on what was and then no longer was the Saddam Hussein regime, we understand quite a bit about why we're in Iraq and why we're not getting out yet. Um, so um, let me, let me, where do I start? Um, let me say a few other things. These industries, weapons, oil and gas, and engineering are all obviously very intimately connected themselves and they're a um, infrastructure hybrid for what the Bush administration needs to carry its economic interests forward around the world. So it needs oil companies, it needs engineering companies, and obviously it needs weapons. But the companies very much need the Bush administration to advance their access to oil, to engineering contracts, to wars in which they can supply uh, lots and lots of weapons. Um, and obviously the two work together. It's not a coincidence that the two work together. So, and, oh, that's up there. Um, I, I have, can we not have that for now? Yeah, yeah. I have a theory which is that we all have a lot going on in our heads and if we add more things it's harder to stay focused and I want you to stay focused on me and what I'm saying. <laughs> so don't look anywhere else or think about anything else. Um, that's why I don't use visuals. Um, so uh, this is the first time in American history that the President, Vice President and Secretary of State are all former oil or energy company officials. In fact, both President Bush and Condoleezza Rice have more experience running oil companies than they do working for the government. Bush wasn't very government good at it, but he's not a very good president either. <laughs> he wasn't hired for his expertise, he was hired for his connections in both cases. Um, and the oil and gas industry has in turn been very, very friendly to the Bush administration. So the oil and gas industry donated 13 times more money to the Bush administration in the 2000 election, 13 times more than their challengers. And in essence, they've gotten what they've paid for, and they is a very relative term in this context, right? They includes the Bush administration, and they includes the oil and gas industry. Um, they have gotten deregulation, the ability to vertically integrate, and you can't underestimate what this means. So the same companies now, because of vertical integration, control exploration of oil, production of oil, refining, marketing, and sales. In fact, the top five oil companies, or is it 10? It's in my book. I guess we're gonna have to read my book. Um, either the top five or 10 largest oil companies in the world, I think it's five, produce more oil every day than Saudi Arabia exports. They control supply, but more important than that, they control refining capacity, which means they control how much oil gets turned into gas. So if you can control that, you can limit the supply of gas, and if you control the marketing and the pricing and the sales, then you can control price. The Bush administration allows that has allowed that consolidation to happen and the deregulation which allows it to be perpetuated which increases the profits of its friends. But more importantly it is fought a war for oil and I'll explain how that works. But let me jump ahead to 10 days, no, let's go a little bit back into the history in Iraq. So um, Ronald Reagan opened up the door to US economic engagement with Iraq. 
Um, part of the initial impetus was uh, to create a buffer in the war with Iran. So Iraq had launched a war against Iran. It was a brutal eight-year-long war. The United States had several interests. One of the interests was that we had had Iran, which had been uh, the U.S. Uh, oil chum <laughs> in the Middle East um, after Saudi Arabia. And then Iran, uh, you know, for those of you who are too young to remember, um, uh, President Carter celebrated New Year's Eve 1977 with the Shah. We had a very nice, cozy relationship. Then there was this pesky revolution in Iran, and the United States got kicked out, and we no longer had that pool of oil. So Iran, uh, the United States was looking for a new Iran, and it was looking to Iraq. So Ronald Reagan provided weapons to Saddam Hussein. He provided intelligence to Saddam Hussein in the war with Iran. And U.S. businesses lobbied aggressively for access into Saddam's market. And they did this through something called the U.S.-Iraq Business Forum, but also through Kissinger Associates. Our, our friend Kissinger just can't stay out of any modern history of, of the United States. And uh, Kissinger Associates lobbied very heavily for U.S. businesses in Iraq as well. And uh, those companies involved in that were Bechtel, uh, KBR, uh, part of Halliburton, Chevron, Exxon, you go through the list. Um, George Shultz, who had been the president of Bechtel for eight years, then became Ronald Reagan's Secretary of State. In that role, he personally lobbied with Saddam Hussein for increased U.S. business access uh, into Iraq. And so did Donald Rumsfeld. The very famous picture of Donald Rumsfeld shaking hands with Saddam Hussein took place when Rumsfeld was Reagan's Middle East envoy, and he was there on behalf of several business interests, including Bechtel. And what, uh, what the U.S. government wanted was for Saddam Hussein to sign a contract with Bechtel so that Bechtel could build an oil pipeline to get Saddam's oil out through the port of Aqaba, Jordan. Um, while those negotiations were going on, though, Bechtel moved forward with managing a petrochemical uh, complex for Saddam Hussein, which made the precursor to mustard gas, which uh, was clearly uh, used by Saddam Hussein. Uh, George Shultz worked very closely with Saddam. U.S. businesses worked very closely with Saddam. I'm going to fast forward through the story just to say they were all there. They were all working with him. They were all making a profit off of him while they could. George Bush Sr. pushed the envelope even farther and worked way more aggressively than Ronald Reagan to increase U.S. economic and corporate ties uh, with Saddam Hussein, trying to get greater and greater access to Iraq's oil in particular, which, in fact, George Bush Sr. Uh, did. He accomplished a tremendous amount of U.S. exports of Iraqi oil, and much of that was done by Chevron. Um, however, Saddam wouldn't really play ball all the way. He wouldn't sign Bechtel's oil pipeline deal. Uh, he wouldn't open up his oil to the extent that U.S. companies and the Bush senior administration wanted. And he went ahead and invaded Kuwait. Um, the lack of interest in, in continuing to work with Saddam Hussein sort of reaches its pinnacle at that point for the Bush administration. Um, I'm not going to debate right now, uh, and we can in questions. Um, did Bush want Saddam to invade Kuwait? Did he let him? Why didn't he take him down afterwards? I'm going to sort of jump forward through that whole discussion because it's a big one and just say he wasn't playing ball with us the way our companies and our uh, political interests wanted. Leapfrog forward to, again, uh, now, now it's 10 days into the current Bush administration. And Dick Cheney has a meeting called the Cheney Energy Task Force. And we only know about the Cheney Energy Task Force because there was a Supreme Court ruling that forced only some of the findings to be made public. But we do know who was there. Bechtel was there. Halliburton was there. Chevron was there. Exxon was there. And they were these guys were designing our new national energy policy. So part of that new national energy policy was a chart, and under the, heading, under the heading of we need to gain greater access to Middle East oil was a chart that laid out all of the um, foreign companies that had contracts for Iraq's oil. So if you'll recall, this is the sanctions period uh, when the United States had sanctions against Iraq, when the whole world had sanctions against Iraq, most of it because of the United Nations. And um, 
Saddam Hussein was signing oil contracts with lots of companies from all around the world, but none of them could come into force while the sanctions were in place. The reason for signing the contracts, however, was because global public opinion was aggressively against the sanctions. Uh, the more that people learned about the brutal impact of the sanctions, the more likely it was that the sanctions were going to be eliminated. If the sanctions were eliminated, all of those other foreign companies were going to get access to all that oil, and the United States was going to be cut out. So we invaded, and it is an absolute fallacy that there was no post-invasion plan for Iraq. There was a very clear plan. It was an economic plan. It was written by a company called Bearing Point, Inc. They're based in Virginia. They had a $250 million contract to rebuild Iraq's economy. That plan was then put into place to a T by L. Paul Bremer, Na earning the name the new dictator of Iraq after about a month on the ground. He was the head of the US, co uh, the US occupation government of Iraq, the Coalition Provisional Authority. Um, in that position, one of the things he did was name a man named Bar al-Alum to become one of the first oil ministers of Iraq. Back to before the war, before the war, a State Department group meets. It says, what should Iraq's oil infrastructure look like after the war? let's think of something that would work for us really well. What the State Department comes up with is a plan that says that Iraq's oil should be, surprise, surprise, open to private foreign corporate investment on terms that are highly favorable to the private foreign companies. And more importantly, we really need to get rid of those pesky pre-existing contracts. So the first thing that Bar Alum does is cancel all those pesky pre-existing contracts. So the, the slate is cleared. And Paul Bremer implements a new economic agenda for Iraq. Um, these policies, if you go back to the start of my talk, are just free, free trade, but you know, with a neocon twist, uh, a flat tax in Iraq, because they couldn't get one here, um, which would brought down the corporate income tax in Iraq from 40% to 15% and brought up all taxes for all people who didn't have to pay taxes. They now had to pay 15% of their income. Um, things like um, making it impossible through a provision called national treatment um, for the Iraqis to give preference to Iraqi companies or workers in the reconstruction. So instead, 150 US companies have received $50 billion for work in Iraq. Um, the largest contracts have gone to Bechtel. Remember Bechtel back in our story? George Schultz now back on the board of directors of Bechtel. Bechtel gets $2.8 billion for reconstruction in Iraq. Parsons, Fleur, Shaw, these names should all sound familiar to anyone who was paying attention to reconstruction in New Orleans. Exact same companies, exact same failure. A brand new report by the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction just came out. Um, which cites tremendous, tremendous, tremendous failure on the part of U.S. companies. And I'm going to touch on this really quickly. Um, so Bechtel gets $2.8 billion to rebuild water, electricity, sewage systems. Um, Parsons, Shaw, they all get huge contracts. We only hear about Halliburton's contract, which we should, because at this point uh, it's up to about $20 billion. Um, but what the contract that is actually the most important to the people in Iraq and probably the most damaging to U.S. soldiers who, are, who have been and were operating in Iraq were the reconstruction contracts. Because this was billions and billions of dollars that went to U.S. companies without competition. They were cost plus, which meant that they were guaranteed their cost plus a fixed rate of return. They didn't do most of the reconstruction. According to the new report, only half of the projects in water, electricity, and sewage are complete. A full third in electricity didn't even begin. Three and a half years later, right, we paid out $15 billion. And the Iraqis, let me back up again, two Bremer orders, one Bremer order fired 120,000 of all the ranking bureaucrats in the Iraqi ministries. These were the people who ran the water systems, the electricity systems, the healthcare systems, the education systems. They were fired because they would stand in the way of the reconstruction, reconstruction that the U.S. government had in mind. And of course, the half a million Iraqi soldiers famously uh, let go by Paul Bremer. What this meant was a tremendous increase in unemployment 
but also people who the U.S. military had thought would do the reconstruction. That was part of the original idea of some of the smarter people, particularly soldiers uh, in the military who were first charged with reconstruction, was that the soldiers, the former Iraqi soldiers, instead of taking their guns home to join the insurgency, would be given, you know, shovels and clipboards and would go to work doing the reconstruction. No, 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 no. We've got American companies to do that. Um, so the American companies came in and failed, 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 failed miserably. Three and a half years, electricity, water, sewage, still not at pre-war levels. In Baghdad, there's only eight hours of electricity a day. There used to be 24 hours of electricity a day in Baghdad. Now, the people in Iraq were very unhappy about this. They needed the jobs. They needed to rebuild their country. They did it in three months after the last U.S. invasion of Iraq, and instead there were U.S. companies running around doing the work. Uh, this created, obviously, a tremendous amount of hostility and definitely has fed, uh, fed the violent resistance and the insurgency in Iraq. Um, while the economic infrastructure was re rebuilt, an uh, oil law, was slow, the one developed by the State Department, was slowly making its way through the Iraqi government. Now, the oil companies are smarter than the Bush administration. They knew, okay, the Bremer orders are illegal. They're illegal under international law. They're illegal under the Geneva Conventions, and I can explain that more later because I'm going to wrap up in two minutes. Um, the oil companies knew that if the Bush administration went in and privatized the oil, that that might be difficult. And so what they wanted was for an elected Iraqi government to pass a law which transformed the oil infrastructure so that they could sign legal contracts with a legal government and everything would be kosher. So this oil law has been shepherded through the Iraqi government through several Bremer appointees, uh, Abdel Mahdi, who's the current vice president, the former prime minister, Ayat Alawi, shepherded this law through. It's now about two months from passage, according to the new oil minister of Iraq. Uh, the U.S. government and U.S. oil companies are heavily involved in, in ensuring that that happens. Once the oil law is passed, U.S. oil companies can sign contracts but they're going to need security to get to work. What's the best security force in the world? 130,000 American troops. So I argue that the troops, unless we have quite a bit to say about it, are planned to stay there until this economic agenda is fulfilled. Now, real quickly, the rest of the agenda. Um, one month after the invasion, the Bush administration announced plans for a U.S. Middle East free trade area, which would expand the economic agenda across the Middle East. With the threat of the Iraq war looming over the governments of the Middle East, these agreements are moving ahead at lightning speed. And this will open up the rest of the region, and already is, to foreign corporate advancement um, with the ever present threat of, of some sort of U.S. military action uh, always present. Now, um, a couple things. Um, the positive side of all of this is that for three and a half years, while the U.S. corporate agenda has moved forward in Iraq, so has the anti-U.S. corporate agenda um, lobbied and worked very, very aggressively against this process. Yay. So. Um, I know I personally ha have, have protested in front of more corporations and been arrested in front of more corporations in the last three years than I can, well, not than I can count, it's four times, but um, that I've been arrested. Um, but uh, that this is a, you know, a very alive force and it has had an impact. So Bechtel Corporation, which has been protested against time and time again, did not seek new contracts in Iraq because it couldn't hand any more of, this, of the public pressure on it. Halliburton recently lost its huge cash cow, the log cap contract. That is through public pressure. That is a $20 billion contract. Do you think that Cheney wanted to cut a $20 billion contract from Halliburton? Hell no. Halliburton had to pay, and the way that it is paid through public pressure and congressional pressure is that that huge contract was canceled. In addition, the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction is now, finally after three and a half years, looking at each of these individual contracts in Iraq and looking at the failure of individual companies. And because of that, 
They just canceled a $50 million contract that Bechtel had to build a hospital in Basra that it's held for three and a half years that it just hasn't built, just hasn't done it. So the answer on the contracts is one, to keep up the pressure, two, to demand that all of the U.S. contracts are canceled, that the money is returned, and most, most, most importantly, that all of the money goes to Iraqi companies. There are hundreds and hundreds of public and private companies um, that are more than capable of doing this work, that are ready to do the work, that have done the work before, that if they held the contracts themselves, would be able to do the work and, as, as experience has shown in Iraq, do it far more cheaply uh, than U.S. companies are able to do it. Um, and that also experience has shown that insurgents do not attack uh, the um, work of contracts held by Iraqi companies when they're at work and that the target is at um, co contracts that are held by U.S. companies even if it's Iraqi workers. Okay, that aside. Um, also, you know, as I said in the beginning, most importantly, I have met with many, many um, uh, U.S. veterans from Iraq who have said that it's through reading and through learning in addition to their experiences in Iraq, but learning about the corporate interests, learning about this larger agenda that has um, helped edify them on the, 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 the need and on the words to say to explain why they don't want to fight, why other people shouldn't fight, and that the information needs to be spread uh, to, to, if soldiers aren't there to fight, then obviously there won't be a war. And if the corporations can't make a profit off of the war, there won't be a war. And if we continue to um, hold the companies to account, our elected officials to account, there are good ones. Remember John Conyers, who I spoke about? He's, a he's in there. There are good ones in there, and they're pushing, and they're, they are um, making a difference, but obviously we can't just count on them. So um, we can talk more about um, solutions, um, organizing that we can do, organizing that everyone can do, and I really look forward to your questions and the discussion. Um, I have a website. It's thebushagenda.net, um, and thank you all very, very, very much for coming out.